you're my strength, you're my hope for all good things, you're my life, my very breath, I'm overflowing with thankfulness, overflowing with thankfulness. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, it trembles at his voice. Heavenly Father, I... Just lift Brother Tim to you. I ask that you would anoint him with your spirit. May the message that you've laid on his heart uh, be real and uh, be able to uh, comprehend and uh, change our lives. I just pray for the power of your spirit to move in us this morning. We uh, pray this in Jesus' name. Well, good morning. God's blessing to each one of you here this morning. It's good to see some faces back again that that haven't been here for a while. It seems like all of us have been just a bit disconnected over the last number of months. But appreciate your presence and may God bless you this morning. Trust that His grace, His peace will minister to our needs. This morning I would like to again go continue the study in James chapter 5. The first 11 verses is what I like to look at this morning. However, before we before you turn to James, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10 for a foundation of um, Jesus' own teachings before we go to James chapter 5. So Matthew chapter 10 verse 23. Matthew 10, verse 23. Well, that wasn't the right verses. I wonder if it was... Um, It's Jesus' words about them that trust in in riches. Um, Let me see if it was Mark. Yes, sorry about that. Mark chapter 10. Mark 10, verse 23. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? Jesus looking upon them saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Jesus here was... um, had just had just finished a conversation with a wealthy man and the man had turned around and walked away because he loved his riches more than he loved God and Jesus turns around and tells his disciples that it is hard how hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God and then the second time he says them that trust in riches and I think that is a key why it's so hard for a rich man to get to heaven is because we have this tendency of trusting in our riches. If I have nothing in my billfold and then finally I have a $20 bill in my billfold, I can trust in that 20 or it might be a 1000 but it's not so much the amount even. But I can, I can start to put my trust in my wealth. And Jesus said it's very hard 
for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And, and he talks about the camel going through the eye of the needle. And there's different, there different ideas of what Jesus actually meant by that. But it must have been either totally impossible or very near impossible, whatever he was describing. Because the disciples were astonished out of measure. They said, well, who can be saved if it's that difficult? And then Jesus said, it's impossible with man, but with God all things are possible. Now turn to James chapter 5. That is a foundation for the first couple verses in James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 1. Go to now, ye rich man, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Why is he warning the rich men of misery? Isn't that what the poor people have? Why isn't he warning the poor people? What is the misery that will come upon them? Luke 16, 25, the, the account of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Abraham said... Son, remember, speaking to the rich man, he says, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. Now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Thou art tormented. That is why he is warning them of the misery that is about to come. Riches are so short-lived... And they will not benefit anyone in eternity, but only for a short time on this earth. And according to Jesus' words, those that enjoy the luxury, the ease of riches on this earth, seldom enjoy the comforts of heaven, according to Jesus' own words. But Lazarus was so poor, and yet he, for eternity, received comfort. Why? Why torment? Why? What is the misery? Why this misery that is going to come upon them? Let's look at verse 2 and verse 3. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasures together for the last day. You know, God never gives us blessings so that we can hoard them for ourselves he gives us gifts he gives us talents to build his kingdom not for our own comfort and security these th these rich men that he was speaking to they had hoarded it it says they're corrupted they're rotting there is this doing no good it's not being used they have heaped it up. They're just piling it in the corner or maybe in their, in their basement. It says, The gold and the silver is cankered. The rust of them shall be a witness against you. Well, we know what rust is. The Greek word for, for this rust can simply, simply means what we think of as rust, when metal starts rusting. But it also can mean as venom emitted by a serpent or a snake, poison. These riches that they were hoarding, that they were piling up for themselves, was poison. It was venom. It was actually an attack from the devil. He had bit their heel, as the Bible would say. He had injected his poison, not by taking away their wealth, but by giving them so much. You know, we think of riches as a blessing from God, and it can be. But it can also be a curse from the devil. Because when men receive riches, many times they don't use them for the glory of God. Many times they get used to, to build myself up, to cushion myself, and it becomes as a poison. Verse 4, Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Seboeth. They had cheated those who deserved to be paid. You know, the, the, 
the reapers were typically the poorer people, the working class. They deserved it. They needed the money. But they never paid him. They never paid him for the work they did. They, they gained riches by taking advantage of others. God noticed that. He heard the cries of the reapers, those who were poor, those who were needing it. God heard that. And he's going to bring judgment. Verse 5, ye have lived in pleasure on the earth. And have been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. The day of slaughter. As you think about um, probably when this was written. They didn't have refrigerators and freezers. So what happens when you have the hog butchering? You have, you have all you can eat for a couple days. And you probably eat a little bit more than you should. Because it's there, it's available. That's the way they lived every day. Not just one day a year or a couple days a year, but every day. Live in pleasure. Eat and nourish yourself. Growing fat. Because they had so much to eat. And yet they had cheated others of their just wages. Their focus was totally on themselves. They took for granted that God had given them these blessings. And they just hoarded it for them, their own selves. Verse 6. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Money talks. We see that today yet. Money talks. The rich get their way. They have a way of getting their own way. You know, even if they should go to jail, they have a way of getting the right lawyer and getting them out. Money talks. They took advantage of the poor and condemned them to death. Whether that was literally or figuratively, they did it because they had the power. They had the means to do it. All about self and not about others. How am I? How am I using the gifts that God has given me? Am I using it for my own benefit? Or am I using it to serve, to minister, to reach out? You know, I don't think God is so concerned about how much money I make, as long as I do it justly, I should say. I don't think He's as concerned about how much money I, I make as He is about how much I have. What do I do with what I make? Do I use it to build God's kingdom? Do I share it? Or do I hoard it for myself? These first 11 verses, I've titled them Stewardship, Humility, and Patience. Kind of three different topics that we're looking at here this morning. Now going on to verse 17, it shifts, it shifts sides, it shifts pictures. I don't know if he is... I don't know if these rich men were in the church because James is written to the church. James is writing to the church. So perhaps these rich men were actually in the church. But in verse 7, he shifts the picture and perhaps he is now talking to the people who were being taken advantage of. Verse 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and have long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain be ye also patient establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh he talks about the farmer or the husbandman who plants the seed he makes preparation he tills the ground but he doesn't see the fruit of it right away He has patience. He needs to have patience. You know, I, I got some nice corn out there about this tall. But if I get impatient and go out there and try to come buying corn, it's not going to work. I need to wait. I need to have patience. And he says just like that, we need to wait. The coming, God's coming, the Lord's coming back. We need to be patient. We need to wait. Don't get 
don't get um, consumed by what is going on. How people are using you. Just be patient. Jesus is coming. He'll take care of it. You know, the farmer plants the seed. He waits. He waters if he can. But then he waits. Jesus had planted the seed, you might say. He had... Jesus came, he died, he rose again. He went to heaven, the seed was planted, everything was in place. Everything is in place today. He is coming again, it's just a matter of patience until the harvest. It's just a matter of waiting. The groundwork is laid, everything is ready. Be patient, he's coming. Justice will be meted out. God will deal with the unjust. You just wait and have patience for the coming of of Jesus. We don't know when. We don't know exactly how. But He will come. Let's wait for Him. Verse 9. Grudge not against another, brethren, lest he be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. I see this as a, as a continuation of that thought. You know, sometimes as we wait, it's easy to start picking on each other. We complain because brother so-and-so doesn't do his share of the work. Or so-and-so doesn't, you know, they don't want to be hosts. Or whatever, I, I, sorry, I wasn't talking to Virginia, so I wasn't pointing fingers at anybody. But... We can start grumbling. We can start complaining. We can look at each other. You know, he doesn't do his job. Or maybe he doesn't use his money right. He's not active in the church like he should be. He says, don't, don't grumble. Don't grudge once against another brother. Lest ye be condemned. Jesus is coming. The judge is standing at the door. He's coming. He's ready to enter. Let him. Let him judge. Let him give the verdict. It's not my job. You know, I might not be as blameless as I think I am. If I stand here shaking my finger at my brother, I just may, I just may be found guilty myself when the judge comes through the door. Be patient. Wait on him. Let him mete out judgment. You know, maybe these rich men are taking advantage of you. Just be patient. God will take care of it. Hold your peace. Don't take it into your own hands. You know, I think we can make practical applications for us today. How do I respond when someone criticizes me? How do I respond when someone spreads some gossip about me? Do I try to get even? Do I try to straighten them out? Or can I patiently wait and let the Lord take care of that? Verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Look at the prophets. How they suffered. And we could could spend all morning looking at stories from the prophets and how they suffered. I just have a few here I want to look at briefly. Jeremiah. He spent... I I didn't take time to really study it out, but up to 11 years in prison. Part of that time was in prison. Part of that time was in a dungeon where he sank down into the mire. And even the king's own men said... We have to get him out of there. He's going to die there. Sad situation. Part of the time when he was in prison, the king commanded that he would get one piece of bread every day from the baker's street. One piece of bread. And there he sat, penned up in prison. Why? Because he spoke truth. It was a political thing. They didn't like what he had to say, but he spoke God's truth. They didn't like it, and they threw him in prison. For possibly up to 11 years he spent in prison there. 
And what is interesting is that when the way he came out of prison was not by a godly man, but by King Nebuchadnezzar himself. King Nebuchadnezzar is the one who actually had him released from prison. The prophet Ezekiel. He was commanded by God to lie on his left side for 390 days and to prophesy to the children of Israel the judgment that was coming. And after he was done with that, he was supposed to lay on his right side for 40 days and prophesy against Judah. 430 days of laying on your side and prophesying. Now, I, I doubt that that was a 24-7. I, I, I doubt that he did that totally all day long. I don't know. The Bible doesn't give us the details. But it was probably not a pleasant experience. But he did it. He did it for the kingdom of God. And James says, look at the prophets. Consider them. Look at what they were willing to do. Their, how they suffered. It wasn't because that Ezekiel had done something wrong. It was because of the nation had sinned and turned away from God. Another time, um, God commanded Ezekiel to take a... To take a sharp knife. Another translation would say a sword. I'd, I'd hate to take a haircut with a sword. But he was supposed to cut off all his hair and cut off all his beard. Something very shameful in the Jewish shed, in the Jewish setting. And then God commanded him how he should dispose of his hair. Something he did. Suffering. He went through not because of his own sin, but because of the sins of the people. But they were faithful. They suffered. They endured. We could look at the, the martyrs, those who, who died, who gave their life. I think of the, the 40 Christians who were taken out to the ice and stripped. And they were made to kneel on the ice in the cold of winter. And they could be released if they would recant, if they would give up their faith. Or maybe, I forget, maybe some of you know the story better, but it, that was the idea behind it. To give up their faith. And they could be released. And one man didn't have the courage to stay on the ice. He denied his God and he left the ice. And as I recall, one of the soldiers that was watching said, uh-uh, there's going to be 40 men. There's going to be 40 men. And he stripped off his clothes and he went out and knelt on the ice and died with the faithful. Suffering for the sake of Christ. Verse 11. To, that's, that's my key verse this morning. If you forget everything else I said, hold on to verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. We count them happy which endure. That man that was a chicken that ran away from the ice. I don't know if he made his things right or not, but if he didn't, I ask you, is he happy today? No. That soldier that was ready, that was willing to take off his clothes and kneel down with the other believers, is he happy today? Absolutely! He suffered for a moment, but we count them happy, which endure. Patient in suffering. Let's read that whole verse. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. There was Job. You know the story. How Satan came and asked God for permission. Actually, first of all, God talks to Satan. He says, Have you noticed my servant Job? And I, that's a question we should all ask ourselves. Do I live such a life? Is my relationship, like we heard this morning, with God such that he would even dare to say, Satan, have you noticed my servant Tim? Would God even dare to say that about you? And then we see how Job sets it in his heart to destroy, I'm sorry, how Satan puts it in his heart to destroy Job, to destroy his faith. 
and how God says only this much, only this much. And God only allows what he knows Job will be able to handle. His own wife, as, as he's sitting there in the ashes, blisters, covered with blisters, boils, and he's scraping himself with a piece of broken pottery. His wife, and he, he stinks. His wife doesn't even want to be close to him. And she steps out of the house. She says, curse God and die. Why are you, why are you messing around? Just curse God and die. And he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. We count them happy which endure. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. How many of us have suffered what Job has? He says, take example from Job. Look at him. Ye have seen the end of the Lord. That's maybe not a very good translation. The end of the Lord, simply um, the end there, means to set out for a definite point or goal. The point that's aimed at, a limit, the conclusion of an act or state. So the goal, what God is after, what God is after, or his end goal, he is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Why? Why does he allow suffering? If he is very pitiful and of tender mercy. This morning I have three, three reasons that come to my mind why God allows suffering. And maybe these aren't the three that you would have come up with. But these are the three I have. The devil is out seeking to destroy us. That is one reason we experience suffering. Just like he was in Job's case. He is out begging for permission to ruin us. He wants to ruin us. He wants to destroy us. And he'll do that with wealth if he, if he can't find another way. Or with sickness. Discouragement. He is out to destroy us. But God knows our limits. God is faithful 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that ye may be able to bear it. God knows our limitations, and he, he, he sets the limits on what Satan can do. However, that is one reason why we suffer today, is it because of, because of our enemy. Another reason, we live in a fallen world. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, we have lived in a fallen world. There is death. There is sickness. There are thorns and briars and slivers and infections. We live in a fallen world. Death. Man makes his own choices and often um, man often suffers because of choices that they made. Many people today are suffering because of poor choices that they made. But why doesn't God protect the innocent? What about the children? Sometimes God does protect the children. But think about this. If God would always protect the innocent, would he not have to violate other people's right to choose? We all have the right to choose. And evil men choose to do evil things. And if God would always protect the innocent, would he not violate evil men's right to choose evil? We want choice. We want freedom to choose. That's part of it. That's part of the reason we suffer. We live in a fallen world and evil, evil people make evil choices. Third reason that we suffer is God is trying to sanctify us. God wants to cleanse us. He wants to make us holy. Hebrews 12, 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, 
and scourges every son whom he receiveth. God wants to sanctify us. He wants to make us holy. He promised to do that for his children. The day that you and I committed to follow Christ, the day that I said, God, I give you my heart, is the day that God says, I will make you holy. I will make you pure. I will clean you up. I will make you bear my image. God is not going to go back on that promise. And as long as I allow him to work in my heart, he is going to chasten me. He is going to sanctify me. That's his purpose. The end goal is mercy and pity. He doesn't want me to go to hell. He doesn't want me to be ruined, to suffer eternity, damned in hell. He is merciful. He has pity on me. And that's why he brings suffering into my life at times. That's why not everything goes the way I wish it would. That's why he doesn't always answer my prayers. Because he knows it's not what's best for me. He wants to purify me. He wants to make me holy. Paul Washer tells a story. When he was a young, young boy going to school, his mom had just bought him new clothes. Nice, clean clothes. He, he, and he put them on and he heads to school. And his mom says, okay, I don't want you playing in the creek this afternoon. Um, you know, whatever, whatever boys like to do. He said, I want you, these clothes are new. I want you to come home with them clean and good shape. Well, he goes to school. After school, he takes his, his buddies, Ted and Joe, and they go do what boys like to do. And they play in the creek. And when everything is said and done, his clothes are dirty and torn. Now he knows he needs to go home and face Mama. And so he, he looks at Ted and Joe and says, don't you want to go home with me? Because they were doing everything boys like to do, and they look just as bad as he did. And so they go home, and he meets Mama, and she looks at him. And she tells him, Paul, you get cleaned up, you go up to your room, and this is what he said, and prepare to die. And he looks at her and says, but Mom, look at Ted and Joe. Look at how dirty they are and how their clothes are torn. She says, Paul, they are not my sons. You are my son. The day that I claim God as my father is the day that he takes control over my life. That's the day that he is concerned about the way I look. He is concerned about the way I dress. He is concerned that I am clean. If I'm not his child, then he'll let me play in the dirt. You can wallow in the pig pen. But not if I'm his child. He's not going to let me do that. God is, wants to sanctify us. He wants to make us pure and holy and clean. Just like himself. He wants us to bear his image. And he's going to work in our lives to perfect that. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them. Sorry, someone help me out. I skipped something there, though. Someone. Okay, seems like we're skipping something in there. But anyway, thank you. The words just kind of left me. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, I can find it here. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. These things don't look always, they aren't, aren't always pleasant, or usually aren't pleasant, I should say. And yet God is working for our good. Difficult times. You know, as I look across this crowd this morning, I would probably say that most of you, youth age or older, in this past week have faced some difficult times, some more than others. You know, some disappointments, some discouragements, some pain. 
You know, some whys. Why, God? Why this? Some temptations. Suffering. My word to you is keep on. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. We count them happy which endure. Don't give up. Press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, I'm not here to say this morning, I, I don't, that's not my business, to say why you experience suffering. Not my business. The judge stands at the door. But my, my encouragement is don't give up. Don't give up. There's better days ahead. We count them happy which endure. My heart goes out to you who are suffering, facing difficult times. You know, I have to think of Sasha Krauss as an example. You know... I don't know her personally, but from what the testimony of her friends, I believe there was a young lady who was willing to endure, a, one who was willing to stand. And I don't know why she suffered in the last hours of her life, in the last day. I don't need to know. But God knows. And from what I, under, from what I expect, from what others say, I think today she's happy. And can you imagine, as she came through that difficult time, that was the last day of her life, coming up to heaven, and allow me to use my imagination, but as God put his arm around her and said, well done, thou good and faithful child. And as he wiped the tears from her eyes, because the Bible says he'll do that for us. Wipes the tears from her eyes. Says no more pain. No more crying. We count them happy. No regrets. Happy. The past forgotten. All to look forward to is an eternity of life. And peace and happiness. Endure for a short time and enjoy the peace of God. You know, the best thing every one of us can do here for our loved ones, young people, old people, everyone here, the best thing we can do for our loved ones, the greatest gift we can give them is to live such a life that when they die, we have no question, we have no doubt where they are for eternity. It's the best thing you can do. My heart goes out to those who wonder where their child is, where their loved one is. Yes, we're not God. We're not the judge. But the best thing we can do is live such a life that when our friends, when we die, our friends can say with all confidence, that I'm sure he's enjoying heaven. We count them happy which endure. You know, I think of those who are struggling with temptation. The battle is real. The battle is real. It might look like there's no hope in sight. Satan is cruel. He's a cheat. He's a liar. You know, some struggle to break sinful habits. But we count them happy which endure. Those who are faithful, the prize is not for those who enter the race, but for those who cross the finish line. God knows how much we can handle. He will not allow us to be tempted above what we are able. Let's not give up. It's never too late. It's never hopeless. God wants to sanctify us. He wants to make us holy. Let's endure. Let's fight. Let's press on. 
Philippians 1 6 being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ God is going to do that he has promised to make us holy to sanctify us he will do it if we allow him to there is only one thing that can hinder God from making us holy, from making us pure, and that's myself. I could step in the way. I could choose. I could choose to follow the world. I can love the world and neglect God, and then God will stop working on me. But as long as my heart is set on God, as long as I give my heart to Him, He will continue to work in me, to purify me, to make me His child. Let's be patient. He is coming. It's short. The time is short. We won't have to suffer long. Let's make wise choices. And even when we don't understand, let's patiently endure because we count them happy that endure. Let's kneel for prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the example of others who have fought the good fight of faith and have laid hold on that eternal life. God, that's my desire this morning. It's my desire for each one here. I ask that you would minister, that you would comfort, that you would bless those here this morning who are in the midst of trials, who are in the midst of difficult times. Give them grace. Give them strength, Father. Help us to endure. Help us to lift each other up, to be an encouragement to each other, not to, not to grumble and complain and to shake our finger at each other, but to help each other along, that we could be faithful, that we could someday hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. We commit this message to you, Father, and pray you administer to our deepest needs this morning. Bless each one here in this congregation. We ask it in Jesus' name. to the heart of